Welcome to Watch This Space. I'm NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, and today we're going to visit the historic Launch Complex 39A, where we launched all of our moon missions and even some space shuttle missions. Today we have a very special guest, Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX. We are at the Kennedy Space Center at Launch Complex 39A, which is a very historic uh, I would say not just launch complex, but a very historic monument for our country. From this launch complex, we launched all of our missions to the moon. We also launched space shuttles. And we have a, a really exciting event that's happening tonight, which is the reason why we're here, which is tonight we're going to launch with what we call Demo 1, which is a mission to the International Space Station with Crew Dragon. In other words, uh, it's, it's not crewed but it is a test flight going all the way to the International Space Station. Now, where we are right now on Launch Complex 39A, we're on a what we call the crew arm, which is the way the astronauts are actually going to get to the capsule so that they can fly to the International Space Station. Now, that's not going to happen tonight, but tonight we're going to test the vehicle, all components of the vehicle. And I am uh, thrilled and honored to be here at this very hist historic site with Elon Musk, who has been an amazing partner for NASA for all of the years to get us to this point where what we want to do this year is launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. And getting to this point, as you and I have talked, was not something that came easy. It's not something that came fast. But step by step, you have gotten us to the point where we're ready almost to take that next step. I'd like to start just by asking you, the, the story that is out there is that there was a time in your life when you made a trip to Russia and your intent was actually to buy, uh, I guess, a, an excess intercontinental ballistic missile. Yeah, uh, without, for, without the nuke. Without the nuke, right? Yeah. Without the nuke, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, um, that's extra. <laughs> yeah, that's actually right. So tell me about why you were there yeah. and ultimately how it resulted in, in this moment right now. Uh, sure. Well, uh, the, the, Originally, I was not going to start a rocket company. Um, I, I really wanted us to uh, become a space race civilization um, and uh, a multi planet species. And I, I, I thought uh, if, if there's something I could do to get the public excited about uh, um, sending uh, people to Mars um, and maybe having a base, permanent base on the moon, I wanted to do a philanthropic mission uh, to send a small uh, greenhouse to the surface of Mars so you'd have this amazing shot of green plants on a red background. And I thought that would really inspire the public. And if the public got inspired about, uh, about sending light to Mars, then they would uh, tell their senators and congressmen to uh, appropriate more money for NASA so that we could do that. So my initial goal was actually just to increase NASA's budget. Um, and then what I found was that, first of all, the Russians really started charging, wanted to charge me way, way more than I could afford. I should, they wanted to charge me more money than I had uh, to, to do the philanthropic mission. Um, and so that was, and you know, not really being an option. Um, and I thought, well, uh, is there any way to uh, make a, uh, a lower cost uh, and especially a reusable uh, rocket system in the US? Um, and so I just read every book I possibly could on rocket engineering um, and decided to, to try giving it a go, essentially to uh, um, give NASA uh, uh, more options, more and more, more, more sort of technology, but like more technology horses in the stable, yeah. essentially, yeah. Uh, to make people to, to use in order to uh, get humanity uh, into space and, and become multi planet species. And you started with a much smaller rocket, the Falcon 1. And was your goal at that point, when you started with Falcon 1, to get to the point where we had nine engines for Falcon 9? Was that your goal at that time? When I started SpaceX, I, I only thought there was maybe a 10% chance of getting Falcon 1 to orbit. I did not at all think that this would happen. Uh, so this is for sure a dream come true. Um, uh, but I, I, literally at the time, I didn't know anything about rockets. Uh, and I was, you know, I've been the chief engineer of SpaceX since day one. And I don't really know anything about rockets, which is why the first three rockets failed. Right. Um, and then. So, so the first three Falcon 1s for SpaceX yes. were failures. Yes. And then, what, but, tell me about uh, the fourth. The, the fourth one, so I, I'd actually only had enough money for three, three flights. Um, so I had no more money left, but we managed to, to the, the, the team sort of rallied, and we managed to put together enough spare parts to, create a, to do a fourth launch, and that fourth launch was successful. Um, and 
Uh, and then so we, what, what would have happened if it wasn't successful? Oh, well, we would, SpaceX would have died. So we sure. would not be here right now, uh, at this moment, getting ready to launch Crew Dragon to the international yes. system. Wow, yeah. so that's an amazing story of, uh, of taking a risk and actually coming out on top and enabling not just you and SpaceX, but enabling the United States of America to come to this very critical point in, in American history. Absolutely, and the, I just like to express uh, a, a, you know, a great appreciation for NASA and, and acknowledge the, the debt that, that the SpaceX owes NASA uh, in, in developing all of the rocket. The rocket technology that, that we built our rockets on was developed by NASA uh, over many decades, and, and we, we without that, SpaceX would not have been possible. Um, and, uh, and shortly after our first success, NASA gave us a, a, a critical contract to resupply the space station with cargo, um, and that was also uh, fundamental to SpaceX's success. And without NASA support, SpaceX wouldn't, wouldn't be here. So well, thank this, you. Oh, thank you. Well, it was long before my yeah. time, but uh, I like thank NASA. Yeah, thank, yeah thank, <laughs> thank, thank the United States of America yeah. for supporting this really amazing Absolutely. opportunity. Well, we have now learned the events surrounding Elon Musk's decision to start SpaceX. Let's meet some of the astronauts that will be launching on Commercial Crew. Yes. Um, but uh, that was in 2001 when all of that kind of started materializing and, and we started having these, these thoughts. I wanted to ask Victor, who's going to be one of our, one of our pilots of, of these crew vehicles, uh, 2001. 2001. Victor, where were you in, in 2001? Learning to fly jets, okay. and I uh, right. actually got my wings that year. Cool. Yeah. So, so, Vic <laughs> <laughs> so Victor was uh, a navy, a naval aviator, uh, getting his wings. What what month was that? 2001. December 2001. Okay. So you got yours about five months ahead of me. I was in May of 2001, uh, but you obviously did much better than I did because I <laughs> I ended up running a museum and then becoming a politician, and you went on to become an astronaut. I don't so. know if you can say that now, sir. Yeah, I don't well, know. <laughs> My job is much easier than you. I, I can tell you that. Of course, uh, we're, we're so proud of, of all of our astronauts. You guys have all made your whole country proud. Bob, how about you? Can you remember maybe 2001, where you might have been at that time? I can. Back in 2001, I was an astronaut candidate. Okay. I started in the office back in uh, 2000 in the summer, July. Uh, so just getting my first chance to come down here to Kennedy and strap crews in. I was just getting started as a big crusader, yep. one of the astronauts that operated the space shuttles before the crew came to strap in and collected them after they, uh, they landed in the space shuttle. So. And your background before that, you were an Air Force flight test engineer. Correct. I'm an Air Force flight test engineer, still active duty in the Air Force. I worked the F-22 program after test pilot school and then worked in a research lab at Eglin Air Force Base prior to that. So it's amazing to think about where everybody was at these different times and how it all comes together at this one moment. In 2019, we're going yeah. to make it happen. Yeah, I never would have thought this would have happened. I would have given it less than a 1% chance. Yeah, it's, it, it is really amazing. Yeah. Doug, how about you in 2001? Well, I, I'm a classmate of Bob, so okay. we started, we were selected in 2000 as astronauts, and so we were still astronaut candidates just kind of learning our new trade. So uh, kind of hard to believe you just got your wings. <laughs> yeah. We were already astronauts by then, or at least almost astronauts. We were working towards being the full fledged astronauts. But, yeah, it's just it's amazing how far we've come in that short amount of time. How about you, Mike? 2001, that's a long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it I was, yeah. seriously a long time ago. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, can, I, can, I can remember it well, but it was 18 years ago. Yeah. 18 years. Unreal. Yeah. That is incredible. Yeah. I was, uh, I'm a flight test engineer as well. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Flight test engineer as well in the Air Force, and it was in Canada, Cold Lake, Alberta. I was on exchange at their uh, flight test center testing uh, the Canadian uh, jets. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So right now inside the Crew Dragon for tonight's launch is uh, I don't want to I don't want to call him or her a dummy. I know. So I, was, I, was, I was trying to avoid the use of the word dummy. It's, tell me, it's, what, uh, tell me what we call the 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 I guess synthetic person. The anthropometric test article. Okay. There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what did, what is it? You decided to name. The anthropometric test, test article. article. I call it Ripley. Ripley. Ripley from. Aliens. Fantastic. Alien. Yeah. It's a great so, character. Yeah. One thing that SpaceX has done really well is capture the imagination of the American people through branding and really exciting things. Launching, for example, a Tesla, which is still in deep space, uh, orbiting yeah. the sun. Yeah. I mean, that was a case where, like, normally we do a first test flight of a rocket, uh, you know, uh, 
if normally like a, a block of concrete would be launched. Right. Um, because you don't want to launch anything uh, valuable like would get destroyed on, on initial flights. On initial flight of Falcon Heavy, uh, the team was originally going to just launch a, a block of concrete. It's like, guys, it's hard to get the public excited about a block of concrete. <laughs> okay. It's just, so like, what, what's something like, you know, that's, that's an image that's going to really uh, stick in people's minds and resonate. Um, and so uh, it's like, okay, let's, let's put a car in space. It doesn't make any sense, obviously. <laughs> uh, you can't drive a car in space. Uh, but at least it's convertible. <laughs> Even though there's no air, it doesn't make any sense. But, and, and, then, and, then, and then putting, um, I guess, an a, a anthropomorph, anthropomorphic test article in, in, in a spacesuit to drive in the car through space. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing I think kids can get really excited about. And like, you know, uh, so I think inspiring um, adults and, and kids and people of all ages uh, to, to want to go out there and explore and become multi-planet species and have a base on the moon and build a city on Mars and ultimately uh, go to other star systems. Uh, we we got to have inspiring uh, images, things that really, you know, have a strong emotional effect, you know, Absolutely. just like make you feel. So, so Doug, tell me, uh, uh, tonight's test flight, um, what are some of the things that we're going to be looking for? What are, as, as, as somebody who's going to be on this, you know, the crew flight, yeah. what are some of the things you're going to be looking for? It's just kind of an end-to-end -end test for the system. So we just want to see the teams work through, all the way through to launch, yeah. the ascent, and then we've got to get the vehicle activated in orbit, then work our way through a rendezvous. And then we're trying to get out to Hawthorne to actually to see the docking out there as well. And so obviously just seeing how the teams all work together and make this mission you know, successful and then all the way through to the splashdown. So I think we're, we're just trying really hard just to see every bit of the system go through our spaces. So I like what you said, the words end to end. So all of the systems and all of the subsystems, they've all been tested over and over again. I mean, so, a lot of testing. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this has really been a joint joint effort with with NASA. Um, like we, we, we could we, this the, on this the spacecraft would not be uh, nearly as good as it is without the input from NASA. Uh, this has been a lot of NASA help here, and I thank you for that. Well, we're we're very grateful for uh, what you're doing, helping us uh, launch American astronauts from American soil once again. And of course, uh, these uh, gentlemen here are the beneficiaries of that. And I can only uh, express uh, the, the, the the best that I can how proud all of America is. Um, with, with, with who you are and what you've done and what you represent. Uh, the entire world is going to see us uh, launching again to the International Space Station. And this time when we do it, um, it's different. Uh, in fact, NASA is a customer. And as a customer, uh, we become one of many that will be using this crew vehicle if, if all goes according to plan and we'll have a robust commercial marketplace for space flight. And that commercial marketplace could be um, sovereign countries. It could be uh, individuals that want to go maybe on vacation to space, which I know sounds crazy, but I'll tell you, and you know this, those folks are out there, and there's a lot of folks that are ready to do it. Of course, they have the same dreams and ambitions that all of you had when you were coming up, so it's, uh, it's a yeah. exciting time. I think this is a good, this is a good step. It, it really is getting, getting uh, people back in orbit. Yeah. You know? uh, and, uh, yeah, it's... it's it's, it's a step towards like ultimately, I mean, what I really want to see is, you know, permanent base on moon, on the moon, permanently uh, occupied human base on the moon, and, and us building a city on Mars. That's like, if I can see the beginning, beginning of that before I die, I'll die happy. Well, the, the, the president's first space policy directive to me was go to the moon, and the word in there is sustainably. So how yes. do we go? We don't want to recreate the Apollo program. Exactly. We don't want to leave flags and footprints and not go back. We want to go and we want to stay. And this time, that means landers, yes. rovers, robots, and humans yeah. in a sustainable return. It doesn't, it doesn't mean at this point we're ready to have, as you mentioned, uh, you know, a, a, a city on the moon. But what it means is we can put together all of the, the components that enable it to eventually be sustainable. And part of that is reusability. Tell Re me. Reusability is fundamental. Um, the, 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 if you, a fully reusable vehicle uh, will cost a uh, uh, hundred times less per flight than an expendable vehicle. And it it kind of makes sense. If you think of, uh, of any other mode of transport, it could be like uh, you know, um, jet aircraft or uh, uh, cars, bicycles, horses, every other mode of transport, boats, they're all reusable. 
the, the only the, the weird one that isn't reusable is is space. That's right. So um, you can imagine how how expensive it would be if every time you flew in a jet that you had to get a new jet, right. um, as opposed to refuel the jet. It would be insanely expensive to fly a jet if it was single use. There wouldn't be anybody flying. No, exactly. It would be like, it'd be like a few research flights at, uh, at, at extreme expense, and that's, that's all the flying that would occur. Um, so the absolutely fundamental breakthrough that's needed is a fully reusable uh, uh, orbit class uh, uh, rocket and spaceship system. Um, and, um, and, and it needs to be fully and rapidly reusable. So uh, the cost of, of reuse must be very low, and it must be able to have a high flight rate. Right. Um, and then, and that's the fundamental breakthrough needed for humanity to become a multi-planet species. And I think one of the key enablers there was a program we called Commercial Crew that went into place quite a while ago. And and and, and what the vision was um, was that we would have multiple providers competing on cost and innovation. And of course, that has now taken effect. And as as you are competing against others in this commercial marketplace, right. you have a you have a huge incentive to drive down the cost and increase the access to space. And and that's materializing here on this crew dragon that we're gonna see launched tonight. Yeah, I actually don't care at all about money at all. <laughs> uh, but I do care about us becoming space bearing civilization. Yeah. And I do know that uh, if, if we don't uh, achieve full and rapid reusability it will not happen. Yeah. And so that's why that's the only reason I actually want want money at all. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you for being a part of this, and uh, it's, uh, it's an exciting night. Well, thank you for watching Watch This Space. I'm NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. You can follow me on Twitter, at Jim Bridenstine. And, of course, if you want to watch this again, you can do so at nasa.gov slash watch this space.